on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. A lot of OU football talk, the biggest questions for OU heading into spring practice, and the things we're most looking forward to for OU's Pro Day. And we finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Sunday, March 10th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts and to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of march all you got to do is visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now we're recording this early sunday morning afternoon why <laughs> do we still do daylight savings time or is this the one that people like i don't know i we got the time mixed up i did it is what it is man it just why why do we do this to ourselves i don't know I don't know, but um, we're set and ready to go. All of the uh, logistical issues aside, we're rolling. Yeah, I'm sure there are some other people that I go, <laughs> why Why do we, but just keep the time this way. It's better. Give us as much daylight. I, I don't know how it works. I just know that people complain about it. <laughs> also, a very important day in the Eichert household, Ted. Sixth wedding anniversary today. Oh, well. Happy anniversary. That's awesome. I know. There's nothing my wife is more thrilled about than me recording a podcast on our wedding anniversary. <laughs> I bet. I haven't That's asked great. her about it, but I'm sure she's just absolutely thrilled. But enough of the chit chat. Let's get straight into the OU football stuff, man. We got a lot to cover mm -hmm. this week, starting spring practice on Monday. We've got OU Pro Day on Tuesday. Let, let's start with spring ball. We do it every year, Ted. Our biggest questions for Oklahoma football as they head into spring practice. What do you got? Well, I guess if we want to start on one side of the ball, we can start on offense. Um, I think for me, the biggest question, I, I don't know if is it the biggest, one of the biggest things is the running back position. I, you know, last year, I think everyone would agree that we had struggles there. We were not good enough at running back. Now, came on strong at the end of the year, saw Chuck, uh, you know, finished the last couple of games on a real strong suit. Hopefully that continues. But I think that we would really benefit from, uh, from, from you know, taking that running back position to the next, next level. And saw Chuck's a returner. You know, we kind of know what we'll get from him. Hopefully he's improved. You know, durability has been an issue for him, but you got a five-star in Tatum coming in. You've got a transfer portal guy in Franklin. Um, we've heard a lot of good things about Hicks, who, you know, really fits that role. I mean, that's going to be a big battle here throughout spring. At least I think it is. And I think we can get a lot better at that position from last year, but I'm not exactly sure who it's going to be. I mean, Sawchuck as the incumbent, you'd think, would have the first rip at it, but you know, it's going to be, it's going to be intense. I, I love that. That's where you went because it's not on my list. This is why we're <laughs> such a good team, dude. And it is, it's a great point. We're, we're going to talk a lot about the line of scrimmage. I assume when we talk about the biggest questions about this team right now, but is there a guy in that running back room that can make something happen when there's nothing there. That's my question. You, you have to have those types of guys to win a lot of games in the SEC. You, you have to have game-changing players at running back. And I know some people think that we are, we're hard on Sachuk. 
I don't think we are. You just, you know what it looks like. And up to this point, and I know injuries have been a huge issue for him, but up to this point, he hasn't looked like a Joe Mixon type player. Those are the types of guys, an Adrian Peterson type player. I know that's crazy, but those are the types of guys you need. Those are game-changing players at the running back position. So it's nothing against Sawchuck. It's just the bar for that position with some of the guys we've had around here. Like the bar is ridiculously high. The bar is Hall of Famer, Pro Bowl type player high when you're looking at that position. Like that's what they need. And the question is, do they have that type of guy in the room? I know it sounds ridiculous, but you're playing Bama and Tennessee and Ole Miss and all these schools now. You're not playing Kansas, which maybe is a bad example because they beat well, us. I think but... It's a, but that's the point is in the Big 12 a year ago at running back, we were middle of the road at best. And that it's just, I think that we have guys on our roster that are capable of much more than what we got a year ago in the Big 12. It's going to be more difficult in the SEC. And I know I mentioned Tatum, like he's not going to be there. He's not an early enrollee, so he won't be there in the spring, but he is coming in. But I, overall, we have to be better at the running back position. We just do. I mean, there were there were times the running game last year was not where we need it to be. And typically it was in like those really critical moments when you have to have something. And a lot of the, the onus for that fell on the offensive line, but there is plenty of times where there is plenty of meat on the bone in critical moments and the running backs did not get it done. Agreed. I absolutely agree. And I, I, you know, I, I got, we, didn't mention Barnes there. Barnes wasn't his self last year. And he had that, that spring injury and missed spring and never looked the same throughout the fall. So hopefully he's had some time to build back and, and get some of that explosiveness. Yeah. Hopefully his confidence is back and he always looked pretty good. Just movement wise, explosiveness wise and warmups. So maybe it was more of a, you know, getting his confidence, getting the mental side of things right for him. I, I don't know, but he's clearly a physically gifted guy. But yeah, running back and just having explosive plays at the from, from the running back position, it's just, it makes playing offense so much easier. But that definitely connects to my biggest question on the offensive side of the ball. Which of the transfer offensive linemen are good? Now, in a perfect world, you're getting a 100% hit rate with Tarquin, Hatchet, Brown, and Wiwu. In a perfect world. I, I, don't, I don't really see that as realistic. You're hoping that's how it works. But you need, you want all of those guys to be capable of starting games for you. But you need at least two of them to be really good. And you can talk about the way that we was looked in workouts and what Spencer Brown has done and how big of a guy he is, but Hey, this is about playing football. I want to know of those four guys who can play football. And I know that they played a lot of snaps, but I, I want to see it for myself. And I want to see what it looks like with an OU on their helmet. How do they react to the new offense? How do they react to, being at Oklahoma, like there's so many factors, but I want to see if any of these guys can play and play at an extremely high level because you, you feel pretty good about where Jacob Sexton is going to be once the fall rolls around. I, I feel pretty good about Troy Everett with some of the strength gains that he's made during winter workouts. We, we talked about Logan Howland and, and the type of progress he's been making. They, they like some of the stuff they saw from Heath Ozida last year. And the big guy that looks like he can contribute at the guard position if he needs to. Jake Taylor, they feel pretty good about him at that right tackle spot. But which one of these seasoned guys can come in and say, I'm going to be the starting guy at this position and take it? 
That's what I want to see. Like, which of these guys are, like, are they just guys? Or do we have a couple dudes in this group? That's what I need to know. That's my biggest question. And then clearly the offensive line is the biggest question mark on the team. So that's where I, I just think so much goes into finding out if a couple of these transfer guys can really play or not. Yeah. And it's going to be interesting because if, you know, if we're two weeks into spring camp and we're not hearing a whole lot about maybe those guys taking over those, some of those positions, it can be worrisome at first, but then it can also be like, Hey, you know, some of these younger guys that they feel really solid about and have had good off seasons. You mentioned Ozeda and, and Howland, I, it would it wouldn't be a bad thing if those guys show up and it, it becomes really difficult to earn a spot in front of them. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of question marks there, but I'm cautiously optimistic. Love that. All right, what else do you have on the offensive side of the ball? Tight end, and I this is a this is a position where we can hopefully go from a weakness to possibly a strength you know we stogner last year and you know some got some other guys in some you know small duty patch duty but didn't really have a weapon either in the blocking game and i give stogner a lot of credit because that was really not his forte and i think he made a lot of improvement throughout the season um but we didn't really have a weapon in the blocking or the passing game at tight end. And now I think we're going to have a really good opportunity to have that. You know, whenever you've got Mitchell, the, the really highly recruited tight end coming in young, but he's big, he's got great length. He's strong. He's aggressive. Um, you've got Robertson coming in. Who's, you know, got some, uh, Roberts, experience. right? Roberts. Rob, Roberts. Sorry. Um, Roberts who's got some good experience. And then, you know, Bauer Sharp seems to be really athletic dude. That's got an edge to him. So, I mean, in, you mix that with the, the group of guys you have coming back. I'd be shocked if we didn't find a formula within that group to have two or three really solid guys at the tight end spot and maybe even develop a weapon there in the passing game. I, it, it, it was one of mine. And the reason it's one of mine is, yes, would it be incredible if Mitchell or Sharp emerged as a legit catch-and-run threat at the tight end position? Absolutely. But also, you kind of just need to know how many tight ends you've got that can go out on the field. And one of the reasons it's so important, so important in my mind and watching the offense last year backs this up perfectly. If you don't have multiple tight ends that you trust to put out on the field, it just limits what you can do offensively. And it makes it easy on a defense to prepare for you. Now, oh, you put up really good numbers last year offensively. I'm not saying they didn't. But as far as the preparation, you knew they were going to be an 11 personnel 90 five percent of the time 98 percent of the time i don't know the exact percentage but you knew exactly what you needed to prepare for from a personnel grouping standpoint now if you trust two or three tight ends and you're able to get into some interesting formation shift in motion some guys put put a guy back in the fullback position put it put guys in wings put them in the slot it just makes it so much more difficult for a defense to have to prepare and I, I know a lot of people are going, what, what is Seth Luttrell and Joe John Finley's offense going to look like? I think the way that this offense is going to look is going to be dependent on how many tight ends they have that they trust. There's going to be a lot of 11 personnel. That's what these guys have kind of been raised in, in, in this scheme. But if they, if they have a couple of tight ends emerge that they really trust, they're going to utilize that and go to those personnel groupings, which was just, it was not possible last year, Ted. No, it wasn't. And 
it kind of builds into another thing for me offensively this spring is what is our identity going to be as a football team? Because I don't, I don't, it's been a while since I felt like we really had an identity. Um, And that starts in the run game to where you can build your play action and other stuff off of it. We, we have been the last couple of years, a, run it and throw it where they're not football team, which, you know, there's a lot to be said for that, you know, RPO stuff, throw it if they're not there, run it if they're not there. Uh, But it becomes difficult in critical situations where, you know, you, you sometimes need to be able to line up, run the football. We have to find what our, what we're going to hang our hat on in the run game. Are we going to be, a big power counter team, gap scheme team? Are we going to be a, an outside zone or like whatever it is that they decide to do? And I think a lot of that, as you mentioned, is going to have to do with the tight ends. Like or if you're going to build a, 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 like a running package, a lot of it has to do with multiple tight ends. And you kind of do the same things out of a ton of different looks. But I'm just curious to see where that goes. No, I'm, I'm with you. Like that's my favorite stuff in offensive football is the chess game with personnel groupings, doing a bunch of complex stuff before the snap to get to your core concepts. And that's, I I think that's kind of how you're framing the question. Like what are the core concepts going to be for this offense? And you know, it's interesting. A lot of times you see this often it's what, what has happened to the NFL and, and how do teams will try and copy that. You look at the two teams that were in the Super Bowl and what they do at tight end is I it shows how much of a game changer the position can be. And it's a, the the approaches are are two different sides of it. On one side you've got a uh a, a guy that's you know super dynamic in the in the in the passing game. And they build a lot of things in there for him. And on the flip side, you've got a team that's got fullbacks and tight ends coming out of their ears and throw all kinds of formations and play actions and stuff at you. So it gives an offense a ton of versatility. And I, I think that's just goes to show what this position could really do for you. And it, it, I think it's magnified at the collegiate level. You're talking about the belldozer for the Chiefs, not Kelsey, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah, right. my guy. Absolutely. No. Uh, another question I've got for this offense, it, and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that it's taken us this long to get to Jackson Arnold, but I have zero, and I mean zero, questions about his physical ability to play the quarterback position. Kid has got an absolute rocket attached to his right arm. He can run. He looks really good physically. It's clear he's putting the time in that he needs to put in during the winter to work on his body. The question I have about Jackson Arnold is where is his processing at? Where's he at mentally? Because physically I've got no concerns, but has he been able to take what Seth Luttrell and Joe John Finley have brought to him and digest it at an extremely high level. Has he studied defenses to where he knows where his eyes should be pre-snap and post-snap? Has he taken those steps at the mental the with for the mental piece of the quarterback position? He's still extremely inexperienced. Guy has played, and I know he played the second half of BYU, but the guy's prepared and played one game as a starter. And we're really not going to know until he goes out there on Saturdays in the fall if he is where he needs to be mentally or not from a processing standpoint. But I think you can gather a lot of where he's at by what you see him do in spring practice. Does he have command and control of the offense? And is he starting to see, it's not going to be perfect, but is he starting to see things clearly on the other side of the ball like that the the defense this is what they're trying to do to us and 
it's a it's a constant process at the quarterback position. You're never a finished product, but we saw some of the struggles for him in the bowl game. How much progress has he made from a processing standpoint from then to now? And he's still going to get way better before we yeah. kick this thing off in the fall, but I'm interested in the process, uh, the progress he has made in that area of his game. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't know how the to way- measure that, by the way. I'm not going to be in the I quarterback know. meeting room with Kevin Johns and with <laughs> and with Joe John Fidley and Seth Luttrell, but I'm hoping that he's made some serious progress in that area. Yeah. Well, I've kind of approached it like this for Jackson Arnold. I'm with you physically for him. Zero worries. Huge arm, great athletic ability. I think he's got great instincts. Um, I came away from the bowl game really impressed with his composure in the pocket. I mean, a lot of times it had totally broken down, and there's a guy right next to him that looks like he's going to reach out and grab him, and he is just eyes down the field, locked in, and got the ball out. So I think he's got just tremendous upside. I, like for me, the if we answer the running back question and say, okay, we've got a dude. If we answer the tight end question and say, we've got three guys that we really like and we can play, and we answer the offensive line question, like, hey, we found our five guys with a mix of transfer guys and development from within. Uh, if that stuff takes care of itself, I don't think we have anything to worry about with Jackson Arnold. Now, the lower quality of run game, the lower quality of protection, right? The down and distances, the third and long start to show up way more. And like, that's whenever you're going to really start to worry about your inexperience at quarterback and how his real development is, is, you know, if he's, is he constantly under pressure? So like, if we answer a lot of those questions in a good way, I think we're going to be in a really good spot, but you know, some of the playmaking and decisions on the fly, I think is, is things that he's going to, to get better at. It's just, what does that, what does that curve look like? And I agree with you. I, to me, it's like, it's not anything to worry about until it's something to worry about. You know? Yeah. <laughs> now I, I'm realizing we're going to hit every position group with my last question. <laughs> classic, classic. And I think everyone, me and you, staff, rest of the fan base, I think everyone's feeling pretty good about the wide receiver position. Mm -hmm. My one question about it is Deion Burke's elite. Not good, not really good. I'm talking elite. Because, Ted, the way that they talk about this guy athletically I don't remember the last guy they've talked about like this. So is he a first round draft pick type of player? Because the hype is there. And can he be just a massive game changer for this team to where not only he's making big plays himself, but where he has such a large influence on what the defense has to do that other guys get one-on-one opportunities. Cause that's just as big of a part as making big time plays is how you influence a defense and what they have to do from a coverage standpoint when you are that dude at the wide receiver spot. So that's my question for the, the wide receiver position. I feel good about where they're at. I think Nick Anderson's going to be even better. I think Farouk has had a, a really good winner, and he's going to be the best version of himself. They got a lot of guys Gibson. at the wide receiver position, but they talk about Burks a little differently. Is he like that good? That's my question. I, at this point, I'm going to be shocked if he's not. I mean, everyone that I've I've talked to, I know everyone that you've talked to. I, I mentioned the other day, I talked to Jackson Arnold a couple of weeks ago, and he was like, dude, incredible. I saw this little clip with Rufus going around and asking a bunch of random questions to random 
uh, players on social media, and he asked one of the kids who on the team would be best as a gymnast, and he said, Dion Burks. And Rufus said, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> it's like everything you hear about it is just like, wow. So I love the position that they're going to have him playing. I mean, that's a quarterback's best friend. The closer you are to the football where those throws get in there quick, you got more leeway there. Uh, so, and I think if you got a guy like that, as you mentioned, it's going to make the rest of that group even better with the opportunities that they'll get. So it, it looks solid. Should I just turn my mic off and let you handle the defensive side? Biggest questions for the defense. I, I think there's, there's a lot of big questions, but I think for the most part, they're it, it's in a really good positive light because you're going to have a lot of competition from some good players that a lot of spots, but, I mean, it has to be said, the biggest question mark is going to be the interior defensive line, right? All right what type of rotation we get there? You got Dejon Terry coming back. He's your biggest player there. Didn't have maybe as big of a role last year or as as big of an impact, perhaps, as, as maybe some people thought. But I thought he was solid, and I think he's going to make some leaps throughout the offseason. I... I only have two questions written down for the defense, and maybe that's a good reflection of what we're viewing as this football team's strength heading into spring ball. Uh, I don't know about you, Ted, but I, I feel I feel really good about where the defense is at, except for maybe the most important position when it comes to defensive football. If you cannot hold up at the point of attack in the interior of the defensive line, it is nearly impossible to play high-level defense, in my opinion. And so my question is, how many SEC-caliber defensive tackles do we have? I feel good. You mentioned him. I feel good about Dejon Terry. Size, strength. He looks, and I know that it's not all about the way you look, but he looks like an SEC defensive tackle. The rest of the guys? A bunch of question marks. Mm -hmm. Grayson Halton, we've talked a lot about him over the last couple of years. Some flashes has shown some explosiveness, but he's just he's been too light. Ha has he taken adding the weight as seriously as he's needed to take it? Uh, Devon Sears sounds like he's going to get on an opportunity. Marcus Strong, Ashton Sanders, of course, David Stone, Jaden Jackson coming in as true freshmen as early enrollees. I feel really good about Jaden Jackson getting snaps early and often at that nose tackle position, mm -hmm. but he needs to, he's got to make plays. So, and I love that he's almost up to 300 pounds. I love that. It, it clear, it's clear to me that it means something to that guy. And I love that. But as I was putting it down on paper, man, there is, it's Dejon Terry and then a bunch of guys that, are unproven. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Unproven yep. guys in the interior. Yep. No, I, I totally agree. And, you know, there's, there's things that Vittables will do if, if that position doesn't come around like they hope, like there's things that he'll have to do, but can do to help try and mitigate some of that. Um, and it helps a lot that you're going to be really good Pretty much everywhere else on the field, you should be really good. Well, which is, yeah. And you know better than anyone. You can be an elite inside backer, elite. And it's impossible to play at a high level if your interior defensive line stinks, mm -hmm. no matter how good yeah. you are. So that's yep. where I'm just sitting at. I think interior defensive line, as we head into spring, I think it's the biggest question on this entire team. I think it's a bigger question mark than the O-line. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I will say, though, that because of how good we're going to be at inside backer, and I think we're going to be really good, it helps 
it helps obviously the communication and the calls and everything and the wider range of things that you're going to be able to do defensively. But it also helps in the run game when your backers know where to fit and get there quickly and get there aggressively and take those doubles off your guys up front to where they're not just sitting there with 700 pounds on them, you know, nonstop. So I do think that will give those guys some good help. And that's kind of my next thing is inside backer. You got Stutzman coming back who is going to be talked about as an All-American, as an All-SEC type of player, as a Butkus Award candidate, and he can have that type of season. Who's going to play next to him? I have no idea. And I think there's a great list of guys. Kip Lewis, Kobe McKenzie, Jaron Canick, Lewis Carter, Coach Venables loves. I mean, we've got some really good players, and I don't know what that's going to look like. Like My first guess is it's going to be Kip Lewis. But if it's Kip Lewis, that means Stutzman playing the, is playing the mic and not the will. Like, what does that mean for him? Is he is he happy with that? Is that how you get the best out of Stutzman? If it's Canick or Kobe McKenzie, Stutzman's playing the will, and those guys are playing the mic. So you've got some different pieces to move around. And Lewis Carter, I think they've played him at the will, but you got some great options. And I maybe it's a combination of some of those guys, and there's a rotation. Uh, with Stutzman staying on the field the majority of the time, or maybe someone wins that job outright. I don't know. It's going to be fun to see that emerge this year because we went from last year having no experience, worried about anyone on the field except for Stutzman, to now I feel good about a bunch of guys. And they weren't perfect last year, but I expect every one of those guys to take a, a big step forward this spring, and you should be able to see it. Yeah, and I think that maybe the most important thing, it, there's no doubt in my mind that can it can do it physically. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that Kip Lewis can do it physically. Same thing for Kobe McKenzie with the way that he's transformed his body. The question I have for that group, except for Stutzman, is, how well do you know it? Mm -hmm. Do you know it inside and out? Can you make every single call you need to make? We, we saw some of the issues that the defense had when Stutzman went out last year. Those, those can't be issues again. Those guys need to know this defense inside and out and know exactly what they're doing to everything that an offense is going to throw at them within reason, right? The stuff that you have planned for. So that is, that's my question. I, I, I don't have really any questions about if they can do, if they're capable physically, Ted, it's all about the, the mental challenge of playing inside backer and Brent Venable's defense. Nope. Totally agree. Totally agree. And this it's the third year in the scheme. They're, you know, they got a new linebacker coach, which, you know, is, I, I think, I think it's, I think your linebacker coach and your defense, like everything's going to be in sync a little bit more uh, than it was previously. Not to say anything bad about coach uh, Ted Roof, but I mean, you've got Venables and many Venables now, which, you know, is going to make things, I think a little more, um, you know, seamless, but I, I look, I'm expecting the highest level of linebacker play that we've had in a long time. And the other piece of that is Cheetah. And let me just say that I have no idea who's going to play Cheetah. And I think it's a good thing. Hey, at least Harrington got his extra year. Harrington is back. We know Kendall Dolby could do it. He had some really good snaps there. And I know he's not going to be here in the spring, but we know DeSan McCullough can have an impact there. Uh, Omasigo was playing it last year. He is incredibly athletic, has a really good build. Um, I know originally, whenever he came, they wanted Kanick to be the cheetah because of how athletic he is. Does he have a good enough base now 
and they're good enough at depth wise inside backer that they try Canick at some cheetah. I don't know, but I like the options that we got there because we still got um we still got you know, several guys in the, in the secondary at safety that can play it as well. So that's going to be fascinating to see who locks up that position through the spring or who's competing there. No doubt. The, the only other question I have about the defense and and I kind of view this through an offensive lineman's lens, if that makes sense. Is OU going to have a pass rusher that O-lines have to worry about? And maybe that's not a great way to put it, but last year, they didn't have that guy at all. There there was no one along the defensive front as I watched OU's defense where I went, that's a problem. He's a problem. You better have a plan for him. That's an issue, Ted. They need someone to emerge. And in a perfect world, it's multiple guys, right? but they need someone to emerge that is a guy that you have to game plan for as a pass rusher. Where you look at a situation and you go, hey, third and seven plus, if all things are equal, we are going this guy's way. We're going to send the protection his way because he's a really good player. They don't have anyone that has proven to deserve that treatment yet. PJ or Mason Thomas. Those are the two guys I'm looking at. I would love for both of them to turn into a th- that type of guy. But Addy Balware and Thomas, you need to be guys that when the opponent game plans, they go, boys, buckle up. We got to know where these guys are at at all times, especially in obvious passing situations. We, we have to chip them. We have to give them special treatment because they're a problem. And that's nothing against Ethan Downs, who is a really good player, but I think we kind of know what he is as a pass rusher at this point. Mm -hmm. Our Mason Thomas and PJ, they need to, they need to turn into guys as pass rushers that concern an opposing offense. And that starts now. Right, sharpening those tools, getting your go-to moves, that starts in spring ball. And I want to see those guys ruin some team sessions. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what that's what they need from them. Maybe it's Willard, the transfer. Maybe, maybe he's that guy. I don't know, but they need a guy or two where the opposing offensive line goes, Oh man, not good. Where the tackle turns to the guard and be like, Hey, you're gonna be there, right? You need those guys. <laughs> yeah. And I I feel like athletically, trait wise, measurables, we're probably in as good a spot as we've been at edge in a long time. We'll see. Like our Mason Thomas two years ago, unblockable. They said can't block the guy. In one on ones, we have no one that can that can block him, and that was his freshman year. You know, battled some, you know, just true freshman mistakes and stuff like that. Last year was hobbled the entire year. Was never himself the entire year until what maybe the final game against Arizona. Um, but now you hope he's had a really good off season. And can go. You heard Coach Venables talk about PJ going to be 265 by the start of spring ball. And we know the measurables that he's got. He's got explosiveness. He's incredibly strong. He's long. So we've got all the tools there. It's just whether or not we can put it together. If we can, if if PJ starts to starts to play like an elite player, our Mason Thomas starts to play like what we've heard. I already think we're going to have the best defense we've had in a long time, but if we can get some of those guys to really hit those marks that you're just kind of, you're hoping that they get to, we could be not just good, dangerous. Anything else on the defensive side of the ball? Biggest questions heading into spring ball? 
uh, there's just going to be a really good, healthy competition at corner, and I'm excited about that. I'm excited about it. We've got we got several guys that can play there. We got some good size. It's just a matter of who's going to win out in the long run. Yeah, I think you and I both feel pretty good about where the secondary is going to be at. Let's get to call your yep. shot then. And we asked you guys the number one question you have about OU's team heading into spring practice. And Ted, I won't lie, a shocking amount of kicker questions. <laughs> Jim Jarrett, does OU thing? have a kicker? Does OU yeah. have a kicker? Special teams play is often overlooked. Uh, DTB Love 05, Liam Evans, Cole's kicker of the year, more Oklahoma stud. Uh, Sober Sooner 1979 said, is Canick going to get better or start, or is he going to fade away? But a lot of kicking comments. Where's your knowledge currently at of the kicker situation? People, we care about special teams here. We do, but I don't think I don't think we try to come on here and act like we know a lot about stuff that we don't know about when it comes to football. I don't know anything about kicking. Let me know who the guy is, right? They brought Deacon in. I assume he's going to make the decision, whether it's Zach Schmidt or one of the transfers or a freshman. I don't know. All I know is I want whoever they trot out there to hit the majority of their kicks, put it through the upright boys. Let's go. I believe in all of you. There's my kicker. There, there's my kicker, my kicker thoughts heading into spring ball is I believe in you guys. You can do it. And I don't think you ever know whether or not you have a kicker until you, it's time to find out if you've got a kicker or not. Like, you you know what it you know what kicking's like in my in my mind. It is the driving range versus being on the first tee. That's right. I, that's how I view the position. Like oh, practice, you're just nailing them. Great, great. What do you do on the tee box? <laughs> like, that's right. Then what do you do in a game? I I don't know a ton about the position, man. I'm not going to critique guys' mechanics and stuff like that. I just. I just want him to make more field goals this season. That's it. Yeah. I, it's, it's, it's kind of more about like, what do you do after you have your first miss? You know, cause that's when things, uh, you start to doubt yourself, you doubt your mechanics, you doubt your holder, you doubt the operation. Uh, it, it's, there's no doubt. Like that is a massive question for this football team. I mean, we, we have missed entirely too many kicks over the last couple of years. And, it's had a real effect on football games for us, for sure, without a doubt. So, I mean, it's a huge question, and it's a legitimate question, and I don't even want to talk about it. That's fair. Because there's I, not I, a whole I, lot you could do. Like, you either got it or you don't, and if you've got a guy, it's it's a huge advantage, and if you don't, it's a huge disadvantage. The look on your face is going to concern a lot of people that watch on YouTube. Well, it's it, it's kind of a look of indifference. Like I just I don't know. Like, what can you do? Uh, you know, it's there's not a whole lot you could. If you don't have a running game or you're like you s strategize on how to fill that weakness. Like if you can't kick field goals, like I you just can't do it. You got to keep sending them out there. I mean, it's just how it, how it is. Be nice to the kickers, people. They need all the support they can get. All right, another big thing for OU football this week. We've got Pro Day. Let's talk about what we are looking forward to watching there at OU's Pro Day. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon. Experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious. That I, I don't know why delicious sounded delicious. <laughs> Java. Humori. 
and celebrate with a Scooter All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Scooter that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice-cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletic Events, at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit SchoonerL.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. And we love Simple Modern. Simple Modern is an Oklahoma-owned company whose mission is to exist, to give generously, and they do. Simple Modern has given away millions to more than 100 nonprofit partners in the last eight years, and they give away at least 10% of profits each year. We love supporting a company that's working to make a difference in Oklahoma and beyond. And Simple Modern products are also the perfect swag for any small business owner. You can customize tumblers, water bottles, and coffee mugs to give to current or potential customers. They also have the best kids' cups. I mean, they're incredible. Just check them out. Check it all out at Modern. Dot com. OU Pro Day, March 12th. Ted, unfortunately, I will be missing it. Mm-hmm. However, you will be on the coverage for ESPN Plus, excuse me, Sooner Vision on ESPN Plus. I'm rooting like hell for all these guys to absolutely kill it in front of the NFL teams. But let's talk about the things we are most excited to watch. First of all, here's the list of guys going through Pro Day. Rondell Bothroyd, Isaiah Coe, Tyler Guyton, Jonah Laulu, McCade Matoyer, Reggie Pearson, Andrew Rame, Walter Rouse, Caleb Schaefer, Austin Stogner, Drake Stoops, and Marcus Stripling. When you look at the list, you think about everything that happens at a Pro Day, Ted, what are you most excited to watch? I'm excited to watch Drake Stoops. Just everything. I uh, Same. can't wait to see see all the drills he does. Which I wonder who's going to throw to him. I wonder what JP threw has thrown to guys in the past, right? Um, I don't know if Jackson Arnold's going to be out there and throw. I, I don't know. Kind of curious to see what happens there. I, I once again, I am not worried about Drake Stoops' testing numbers because the tape is there. Mm-hmm. Right. The tape is there. Ultimately, teams look at the tape. Now you look at the testing numbers and you kind of cross references what the, the way that he tested doesn't match up to what we see on the tape. But it does feel like Drake Stoops' 40 is going to be a really important number for him. What do we think? For is it is he going to surprise? It's going to be like a four five situation. Low I, four six, like I have no idea. I don't either. I think like, he what can, happens if he comes out and runs a high four four? You know what I mean? Like, hey, I, I wouldn't take that away from him. I, I think you know he shows really good quickness and explosiveness. He's not like a bad athlete at all. Um, I think if he runs in the four five range, that would be really really good for him and. Maybe more importantly than that is like how he does like in the in the three cone and the in the pro agility stuff. Like it, if he shows some excellent quickness there, I think that that's probably going to be what people are looking a little more for. But the forty does have a chance to be either a red flag or a spot. Say, hey, that's the quickness we're looking for for where he kind of translates at the next level. If you're looking, you know, when you think about his 40, hopefully he puts up a time where every team goes, hey, good enough. And I- I'm with you on his three-cone time. With how how crisp of a route runner he was last season, you would expect a guy that has, like, that type of suddenness to have a really good three-cone time. And I can just tell you from experience. The three cone, it is all about training it. And if he's trained it properly, with the way that he's able to change direction, he should have a really, really good time. Mm -hmm. So I am, man, I'm excited for him, but I'm I'm also nervous, dude. I I want him to do so well, so badly. Well, if I know anything about him, 
whenever the moment is crucially important, he performs at his best. So I think that's going to translate to to pro day as well. I'm with you. One of the things I'm most, most interested in watching is just Walter Rouse. Yeah. Because he did drills at the combine, but he didn't, he didn't run. He didn't do the short shuttle. He didn't do the three cone. He didn't do any of that stuff. I would expect him to do it at pro day. And by the way, I've talked to Walter. He wants to come on the podcast after pro day. So we're going to figure out a time. I just, I love that guy's personality. I love his energy. Uh, I'm really excited that we're going to have him on, but, and I don't want to be too dramatic here. His 40 and his short shuttle, I do think is going to influence how teams look at him because just from watching the guy and I thought he was really, really consistent for, for OU at left tackle in 2023. But I think he's probably best fit to be a guard in the NFL. But if he puts up good times in the 40 and the short shuttle, I, teams will definitely allow him to fail at tackle before they bump him inside. So those times, I think, are going to be really important for him when it comes to how teams view him. Now, there's going to be a lot of teams that say, hey, we didn't see a bunch of instances where athleticism seemed to be a big issue for him at left tackle in 2023. We're going to start him at tackle, but if the times aren't good, that will start a conversation in a lot of front offices with how teams view him. And if you're viewed as a tackle, you typically make a lot more money than if you're viewed as a guard. But I just, I think it's going to be really important for him. And I'm excited to see, like, I have no idea what those times are going to look like for him. So I'm really excited to see how he performs. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm always interested to, uh, to peek in because you don't get nearly as much of a look like at the combine and stuff, but to see some of the strength numbers from these guys, uh, see what, you know, see what Bothroyd and, and uh, uh, Isaiah Coe and Stogner and I, I think Lulu. out of all the bench press, the bench press numbers for every guy that's going through pro day, I'm most interested in Coe's, right? Like you, you would expect him to put up the biggest number, or maybe you view it differently, but that's that's who I expect to put on a bit of a show when everyone's surrounding the little bench press there in the indoor i or at least i hope i'd be surprised if he didn't yeah i i think so he's he's a very powerful explosive guy so yeah that's that's always something that's that's going to be fun to watch and um yeah i i don't know i think uh just all in all it's an interesting group of guys i'm also interested to see what the turnout is um from from scouts i think I think there's going to be a lot of guys there to see Tyler Guyton go through his, because I bet he doesn't do a whole lot of the, the 40 or stuff like that, but to see him go through the drills and the footwork stuff and get their hands on him to be able to do some different movement drills. I think there could be a, a big group of guys there to see that. The best thing for Guyton is he's got a couple of other linemen with him. Mm -hmm. So hopefully little, he gets a little, little breather. breather. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of wood because you got Matoyer and you got Rame and Schaefer and Rouse. So he's going to have, they're going to have a lot of linemen going through the drills. Same and that can Eli. be, that can be extremely beneficial to staying fresh and looking good as you go through that. There's nothing work worse than the O lineman that like pukes during his pro day because he's only got two guys and he's just taking a million reps. So that is, that's beneficial for Guyton for sure. Dude. Jonah Laulu is a guy that is just completely flown under the radar since the season has ended. And defensive tackle is definitely his best position. I feel like he just ran out of time in his college career. And, and I feel like if he was able to continue to play college ball, his best football is still in front of him. Mm -hmm. I, I'm interested in seeing what he looks like. Maybe the most interesting number is what does he weigh? 
yeah. when they do the measurements to start. But I, I feel like his best football is ahead of him. I feel like he's got some tools that some teams are going to be interested in. He's my expectation is he's going to be an undrafted guy, but I could see several teams going, Hey, we're here to see guy, but who the hell is that guy? It's like a three, four defensive end, you know, and, or, or, you know, he couldn't even play interior three technique. He's just, he's got such great length, you know, big, gigantic dude. And if he's put on some weight, yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I think moving inside last year, he had some really good moments, really good in the twist game uh, as a penetrator, did some good stuff. I'm with you. I, I'm, he's got to be strong. You know, the way you see him play, he's, I bet he's a super strong guy on the bench press as well, even though he's got really long arms. I, I like to remind people of this. And, and Laulu may be a perfect example. The NFL, it's not, they, they do not care a ton about what your production was like in college. And it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. It is all about, your physical traits and how they translate to the NFL. And when you look at La Ulu, he's got some physical traits that really get you excited yeah. if you're an NFL team. Right. So maybe out of all of these guys, he's kind of the under the radar guy that the seventh round comes around and someone says, Hey, we're, we're drafting La Ulu from Oklahoma. I, would it shock me? No, because I think he's going to have some really good measurables. Now, I'm interested in you know, what type of athlete he actually is, what the 40 looks like, and maybe more importantly, what his 10-yard split looks like. Yeah. But I don't know, man. I just feel like he ran out of time as he's, he was developing at the defensive tackle position. Does that make sense? No, it does. But, you know, he played. He played edge whenever he first got here, was a transfer guy, played edge uh, previously, and then they bumped him inside almost kind of as a as a numbers thing and it ended up working out really good for him. And he was late. I think he was fighting the weight gain at edge, right, to be able to be athletic enough to play some of the stuff out there on the perimeter. And then late in the game was moved inside, so – he hasn't been on the weight gain train for a long time. So I don't know. He may show up and be 315 pounds. I don't know. We'll see. That's why I, I think other than what Drake does with all the testing stuff, La Ulu may be the guy that I'm just really excited to see how it goes. That's a good point. And as I was looking through the list, We are, I like to think that we are very fair and honest when it comes to how we view OU guys and what they can be at the next level, right? Now, some people may say we're a little critical at times. Some people, you know, call, may call us homers at times, and it is what it is. But OU has had at least four guys drafted every year since 08. And when you look at this group, that streak feels like it could be in jeopardy. And when you think about why OU Pro Day is really, really important, it the streak is what it is. It's going to end eventually, you would think. It is what it is. But it'd be awfully nice if Drake Stoops went out there and burned a 40 and people were like, hey, we can draft him in the late rounds. Mm -hmm. guy can play guy can run uh, laulu that type of guy hey he's got the measurables look at his testing numbers like, he's worth the seventh seventh round pick you feel good about i, I guyton and rouse are absolute locks to be draft picks in my mind no doubters yep rame was a no doubter until he put up some just be real some poor numbers at the combine and I, yep. I'm interested to see if he'll retest at Pro Day. So you've got those three. And then if you want the streak to continue, you you got to find a fourth. And I, I think that's why, especially for Drake, 
maybe Isaiah Coe. If his arms are long enough, if he puts up some good numbers, they feel good about it. But I don't know, man. It feels like that streak is – it feels like it's a little bit in jeopardy to me. Maybe. Do you agree? Yes, but – and maybe I'm too optimistic, but I don't. I think almost without a doubt Drake Stoops gets drafted. Good. That would make know, me very, very happy. Yeah, I don't know where – I don't know like how high, but I'm pretty sure that he's he's going to get drafted. I'm with you on Guyton and Rouse. I think Rame, I, I think some of the numbers, and I don't know, he's got a little bit of an injury history there. I, w- I wonder how that went at the Combine. It's quite a bit um, working against him now. Yeah, so it would he would go a long way if he performs well. Uh, at pro day, but he's also got a lot of film, really solid player. So, I mean, I I feel pretty strongly that we'll get four guys drafted. Guyton, Rouse, and Drake, and between Rain, Co, and Luulu, I think one of those guys will get at least one will get drafted. We just need we need we need some good pro day performances, Ted. You're going to be there. You're going to be on the call. Pressure these guys into running fast and jumping high. Come on. I'm going to do it. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Some, I don't know how yet, but I'll figure out a way to get that clock moving a little slower. Tune in people. It's going to be fun for a couple of those guys. Massive, massive day for what their football future looks like. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, all right, all you grill masters, listen up. Didier Ranch delivers premium quality beef that is 100% raised in Oklahoma right to your front door. Go to DidierRanch.com, D-I-D-I-E-R, Ranch.com to order one of their premium quality beef boxes and use promo code OKLAHOMA15 for 15% off your order. Filet, ribeye, New York strips, sirloin, steak burgers. They've got it all, and they ship anywhere in the continental U.S., and Oklahomans can get deliveries in just one to two days. The only thing better than having a lot of premium beef on the O&D line is having premium beef delivered right to your front door. Due to your ranch, tradition tastes better. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and some ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game, and with all the garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Perfect place to watch March Madness. I mean, perfect. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? I've got a group of winners. Baseball uh, series win over UCF. They swept the doubleheader on Saturday. They've got one more uh, today on Sunday, but they already won the series. Softball sweeps the doubleheader against Iowa State. Uh, so they got back on the uh, the winning train, and, and they play another one on Sunday as well. But that's two series wins there. Um, you had the women's hoops won. I think what they beat TCU, and now they're into the semifinals, and I think that game is on Monday. Uh, so pretty good stuff. On the winning train with uh, with women's hoops, softball, uh, put the put the loss behind him and baseball's off to a strong start. Love it. I love how you're you're starting to be like me and just work multiple in. Love that about you. <laughs> I, I think we're in a good spot though. I, good I watched, spot. yeah, I watched quite a bit of the softball. Sydney Sanders, have yourself a weekend. My goodness. No kidding. Just hey, you know what you know what makes winning easier? If you just blast home runs. It makes she everything so out of the park. <laughs> you just hit it over the fence. It just makes everything so much easier. She, she was fantastic for them. So that, yeah. I mean, clearly the double header, you know, you look at what the first win was four, nothing. Second win was 11, two. I mean, she was, she was huge in those two wins for them. And I thought, I thought Kelly Maxwell looked as maybe as good as she's looked so far in an OU uniform in that first game. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think after the streak ending, I think the pressure's off 
I mean, th- there's a lot of new new players on the roster and on the team, and they've stepped into that pl- pressure pack situation. And I think now that the loss is over, I think there's a little more comfort in in you know getting up there and, and just playing the game and winning the game instead of trying to continue the big streak. So I, I think you're going to con- continue to see different players settle into a little bit better of a groove. I, I thought, and the Sooners are already up 3 nothing. Sooner softball already up 3 nothing in the bottom of the second against Iowa State right now as we record. But I kind of like Patty Gasso's tone after the doubleheader. Got very positive, very complimentary. Like did that that's what we are as a team type of stuff. I I I just she's so good at that stuff, man. It's it's like she's been doing it at the highest level yeah. for a very, very long time. It's like she does what she's doing, but I don't know, just her presence after the game. I, I just feel like she knows exactly how to handle every situation as a coach. Mm-hmm. And some coaches just don't have it. And she's just She's got it, man. And I let I just love how how much awareness she seems to have for exactly what she needs to say about her team in nearly every moment. I don't know. It's, just, it's so impressive to me. Nope, that's right. That's that's exactly right. Um they're in a good spot. I know there was there was the panic button for some folks, but they're gonna they're gonna work themselves into a really good position. They'll be just fine. Women's hoops is in a is in a good spot. They are on an absolute terror right now. Uh, maybe they'll get recognized if they, you know, they've won the Big Twelve twice in the, in a row. I wonder if they win the Big Twelve tourney, they'll actually be rewarded with a decent seed in the tournament. Um, but that's all good to see right now uh, for the Sooners. I love it. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? It, it's OU men's hoops, but it's. You know, everything's not horrible, okay? I hated to see Suarez, uh, you know, roll the ankle again. was horrible. Yeah. To have, what would you call the key to the team? The guy who's been your best player. He's been great. In conference play great. and has battled, and to his credit, he's. Not, I don't think he was close to 100%. And he was playing through the pain, and for him to do that, in garbage time, I that I was viewing it as garbage time at that point. That that hurts, man. That really, really hurts. Yeah. I was kind of shocked that kind of given the situation of the game, that you I was kind of surprised that even that McCollum played. I, I wasn't sure how that was and even uh DeSue for Texas, I wasn't sure because you know, kind of where everyone stood, it almost felt like you're into the tourney, not going to be a whole lot of difference in seeding for the Big 12 tournament. So maybe some guys were going to rest, but that wasn't the case. Um, I don't know. Uh, Texas played a great game. I mean, Texas was, they were dialed. So I don't know. I feel, I still feel fine. I think, I think we're going to be fine once we get to the postseason. Um, what we play TCU in the first round of the big 12 tourney, Texas plays Kansas state. Um, you know, TCU has been solid this year, but I think we can win that game. Yeah. That'll be on Wednesday. We'll so see what we get from Suarez though. I mean, that's, that's the problem man is it did not look good. You know, when he wasn't putting any pressure on that ankle to get off the floor with where that game was at. And it, what was it? I don't know, maybe an 11 or 13 point game at that point, but it felt over to me and Mm -hmm. I saw him go down and I uttered not appropriate language. Well, you know, once you've rolled your ankle, the second one, it hurts way worse, but you recover from it way quicker. So that's Doc, my hope. Dr. Ted, ladies and gentlemen. Look at That's my view from afar. It's an optimistic view from afar, though. I mean, it is. Because if we don't have him, and uh, that's that's a totally different scenario for our basketball team. You are you are correct, sir. So we'll see how it goes in the Big 12 tournament. 
for the Sooners, but I I don't share the same optimism that you share. I just I'm just gonna be honest with you. But we'll see. We'll see. We're hoping for the best. I, I do think they've done enough to be in the NCAA tournament, but you just hate making to, it really hard, right? You just hate to limp in literally and figuratively into the tournament by you know getting smacked by your rival on the road and then uh, uh, hopefully they get this first one uh, against yeah. TCU. We'll we'll see though, but there's only a couple of minutes left and he rolled it again. Oh, brutal. All right, let's get to my winner and loser. But first, attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. From my winner of the weekend, thought about going with Chris Jones. Woo. They paid that man. Chiefs mm. paid that man, Ted. Now, five-year deal. I'm not sure what the total number is, but everything I saw that was reported is the first three years are all guaranteed, and he's going to get $95 million in those first three Dang. years. He deserves it. That man is an absolute problem. He is a game wrecker at that defensive tackle position. So... Got a bunch of Super Bowl rings, and now he got his big payday. Congratulations, Chris Jones. You deserve it. You give me anxiety as I watch. <laughs> I feel I just I'm watching the sitter and guards. So I'm going to say, oh, oh, no, no. But just a hell of a football player and is getting rewarded for what he's done for that franchise. Yeah. No, he's a stud. And, um, you know, getting him locked up, they're in a good spot. They've got a lot of their best players locked up. Uh, in some good good spots, they need to have a big draft. And I guess uh, did you see that Mahomes was texting Worthy? Yeah, That'd be a nice fit for them. Oh man, just just what they need more weapons. Mm -hmm. I, there's, it's no secret they could use a wide receiver or two. So we'll, we'll see. But paying Chris Jones is that's a smart decision. Now my winner of the weekend. The Oklahoma City Thunder. And for a lot of reasons. First of all, Friday night, Thunder beat the Miami Heat 107-100. Really good basketball game. Heat were really good in the first half. Threw all kinds of defensive looks at the Thunder. Thunder kind of had to process all that. Then they outplayed the Heat in the second half. But in true zombie Heat fashion, they just would not die at the end of the game. And it kept it close, but... Shea Gilgis Alexander, man, just some massive shots late. And that the step Thunder... back was beautiful. Oh my gosh. He just so effortless. Ice water, baby. Ice water in that man's veins. And when you look at the game, the Thunder didn't shoot it particularly well, but had another good win against a, uh, another good team. And all of a sudden, you look at it. Josh Giddy's put together a string of good games in the last week. Uh, Jalen Williams is back. And I thought he, uh, not, not J-Dub, but J-Will. Mm -hmm. J-Will was back off the injury and gave him good energy. Uh, I, I thought that he did some nice things. Uh, J-Dub continues to be just an absolute stud. But SGA had 37 in that game. And has now scored 30 or more in 47 games this season. It's crazy. Crazy. I don't think he's ever going to be a guy that goes for 70, you know, like a Luka Doncic or like those, that, that type of stuff. But the consistency that he's playing with, dude, it is, 
it's awesome to watch as a Thunder fan, and it's impressive as hell. The guy, he has been awesome. It kind of feels like Jokic is starting to take a hold of the MVP race, but SGA is right there with the man. He is, she's just been so good. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that there's maybe a little bit of a uh, Jokic fatigue there from some people. I don't know, but uh, he's incredibly impressive. Hopefully he gets that done. Um, I, you know, I, I think that we know who they are at this point. It's just, how does that translate to postseason basketball? I mean, that, to me, that's kind of the next, the next question with this group. And I don't know, really fun to watch though. That game. So there's a, there's a couple factors here, but I think after they won that game is the, is the first time where if I'm being honest, I've really felt like they can be the number one seed in the West because, and, and we're recording this before they play the Grizzlies and I expect them to win that game. So that will take them to 45 and 19, which by the way, means they will hit the, the over under win total with 18 games to go in the season. <laughs> pretty <laughs> nice, pretty impressive, but there was kind of this four horse race right for the one seed with the Clippers with Minnesota and then with Denver and, and, and maybe Denver finishes the season really, really strong and they end up being the one seed. But the news that Carl Anthony towns is going to miss some significant time with the meniscus injury. That's a big blow for Minnesota. And, and you have to assume they'll lose a few more games than they would have. Uh, with him out. So I think this is the first time where I've looked at everything and gone, you know what? The Thunder can be the number one seed in the Western Conference. And they've won eight straight home games. They're tied with Denver for the best home record. But all of a sudden you look at it and not only do I think they can be it, the guys in that locker room have to be looking at it and going, hey, we're really good at home and we can get this number one seat. And they may, they, you got to be smart about it, but they may push hard for that number one seat. Where are the Lakers? Fair point. The Lakers currently are the nine. So they're going to be in one of the play-in games. So they are, they are, yes, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> so remember the way that the plan, the first six are in, and then you've got the play in games. So currently, yes, the, the Lakers are in play to be what eventually would be the eight seed to take on the one seed. Are you yeah. suggesting that some maneuvering could be discussed to avoid the only team that has won a season series against the Oklahoma City Thunder this year? Well, I think it would be awesome, both mentally for the team, confidence-wise, something to hang your hat on, and would help you throughout the playoffs, clearly, being the one seed. I may do some dodging of the Los Angeles Lakers, if possible. Things have not gone well in the last three against the Lakers. <laughs> no. the, the size and strength has been an issue. So Styles make fights, and that is not a good style matchup for us. Let Denver play the Lakers. Yeah. I'm fine yeah. with that. Do we sound know. scared of the Lakers? Do we sound scared of a team that is 35 and 30 and actually has a negative point differential? Are we being a little cowardly here? Because normally with OU football, we're like, bring it on. Give us all the. Why don't we do that with the Thunder who are. Well, here's the thing, because I don't think 
like the Lakers as a veteran team, we've seen this in recent years where care a lot less about the regular season. And when the postseason gets here, it's crank it up time. Like this is whenever we're actually dialed in. So I don't know how much of that is still the case with them. I mean, LeBron is still incredible, but how much longer can he continue to go into the, like to be able to crank the, the level up? I don't know. I mean, I honestly don't know. I'll defer to you. Is it, is it better to have the one seed and play the Lakers or is it better to dot for, to not have that matchup? I think, For the long term, it's better to have the one seed. I would rather see this team face the Lakers in the first round and see how they respond. Personally. Now, is that the best matchup? No. But I want to see how they react to it. Does that make sense? Like, I want to see... The Lakers have to come to Oklahoma City, which, by the way, how much fun will that be? If awesome. that's the first round matchup with home court advantage, I mean, that's going to be so awesome if it happens, but I would just want to see how they respond to that situation. If you, if this core group of Shay and Chet, and obviously throw J dub in there and, and Dorton getting all these guys, right. Let's see what they're made of right out of the gate. That's kind of, that's yeah. kind of my mentality on it. I feel like, like the last time around when we had a championship window, I feel like the roles were reversed, though. They just got into the playoffs and played the Lakers in the first round. Good Lakers, but took them like way further than anyone expected, right? Then next year they went to the Western Conference Finals. Then the year after that they went to the finals, right? And it feels like this team is ahead of that pace. I. I view a matchup in the first round with the Lakers as a win-win. If you beat them, I mean, you just beat LeBron James, Anthony Davis. You've got home court advantage. Like you're moving forward. You're feeling confident. And if you get beat, feeling a little embarrassed, a little a ton of motivation for the off season. Hey, we're not going to let that yeah. happen again. You, you know what I'm saying? It feels like That's a win-win win to me. No, I like that. I like that. But I know that that series though, as far as like, that would be wild. That yeah. That's what you want for a series. Sign, sign me up. As Absolutely. a basketball fan, sign me up. I'm yeah. all for it. You get more buzz out of that one than any other matchup you see, regardless of who, who it is or where it is. No doubt. My loser of the weekend, Kansas basketball. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. They, yeah. have, they have dominated the Big 12 Conference. There is just no other way to say it. Man, they have absolutely dominated the Big 12 in hoops. Houston comes into the conference in their first year and wins the thing outright in the regular season by dismantling Kansas by 30. I mean, just stomped them. Oh, it was, it was over early. And 76-46, hold them under 50 points. And there's no other way. Kansas went into Houston and got punched straight in the face. They got knocked out, and Houston just kept punching them in the face. That thing was over early. That thing was over at halftime. Stop the fight. Yeah, just like, oh, he's already dead. Stop the fight. Houston, they just locked them up completely. Kansas couldn't do anything offensively. And with the loss, I think Kansas actually ended up finishing sixth in the Big 12. Mm. They've lost three of their last four. I think they've lost six of seven, six of its last seven on the road. Hunter Dickinson dislocated his shoulder in that game, in that beat down. We'll see what his status is looking like over the next week or so. Kevin McCuller, who came back for the knee injury, I don't know why they played him in this game. 
he didn't look good at all. He didn't play in the second half at all. You look at it, man. I If I was Bill Self, maybe you just punt on the Big 12 tournament and say, hey, let's try to get McCuller and Dickinson as much rest as possible for the NCAA tournament. But I think Lenardi's got him as a four seed right now. If they don't win a game in the Big 12 tournament, they're in jeopardy of maybe being a five seed. I, I don't know, man, but this is not what we've come to expect from Kansas basketball. And Houston came in the league year one and said, this is our league now, boys. <laughs> I mean, no doubt. How impressive I, I is like, that by Kelvin Sampson and that crew? My goodness. That's crazy. And it's getting worse before it gets better. Arizona's joining. Uh, I, I feel like Kansas is going to be the Mista Mista lady from Happy Gilmore. Get me out of here wanting to go to the SEC or the Big Ten because, man, the Big 12 was brutal in hoops, and it's about to get worse. So I, I can only imagine how sad it makes you, Ted, to watch Kansas basketball struggle like this. I know it. I know. I do actually – in a weird way, feel bad for him. Like what? I guess maybe I feel bad for their fans. I don't know. Maybe I don't. It's just. Things are changing in a big way for the big 12 and none of it feels good at the moment for Kansas, right? Uh, Football wise, it feels pretty good. All right, they may have a better chance of winning the Big 12 in football next year than they do in basketball. When's the last time we've said that? Wow. I hadn't thought of it that way, but <laughs> you might be right. Man. I I don't think Kansas fans know how to even approach that. Wait, wait, uh, wait. No, football school. Oh. I, I'm just – I'm happy for Kelvin Sampson to come into the best league in college basketball in year one when everyone's saying – Okay, Houston, you're about to find out. You've been playing in the American, you know, making your deep tournament runs. It's been cute, but you're about to find out. And they said, all right, let's do this. 15 and three in league play, number one team in the country. I think they've got the number one net rating at this point. 22 in a row at home for Houston. I feel like, didn't they lose their first Big 12 game too? Yeah. It's like, yeah, welcome to the league, boys. Yeah. <laughs> And it's just, it's really, really impressive what Kelvin Sampson's been able to do. And there's really no better way to put an exclamation point on a regular season than completely dominating the team that has absolutely dominated this league. So I just, the way that they, they made Kansas look awful in that game. That was, whew. That was impressive stuff. This, like, we are going to be Houston going to the SEC. And that's what we're going to do to Alabama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Late in the season. In softball. (laughs) (laughs) I'm kidding. Uh, uh, I'm kidding. Well, I'm not kidding. It's we're going to smoke everyone in softball still. But the football, we ain't scared, baby. Let's go. That's right. Let's go. Birthday shout outs. Happy first birthday to Maverick Calvert. Happy 24th birthday to Travis Robnett. Happy upcoming 50th birthday to Big 5 0 to Eric Benjamin Halsey. Happy 52nd birthday to Leanne. Just Leanne. Maybe she's a one name. So like Leanne. It. Happy birthday, Leanne. Happy birthday to Eli Covington. And congrats on getting married to Christy and Kurt Lehman. Lehman's had a hell of a run here in the shout out section. Birthdays and uh, weddings. Awesome. And and this was a first, I believe. Matt Darvin. Yeah, you, Matt. Thanks for listening all the way out in Singapore. Yeah. Which, by the way, I've been been told Singapore is really cool. I'd love to go at some point. Yeah. On that note. Episode 403 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Wednesday. Just a reminder, 
please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tell all your friends to do the same. Hope you all have a great start to your week. And until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.